The man who murdered Ashling Murphy was convicted last week. Ashling's murder was deemed a watershed moment, a turning point. Yet, 22 months on, a further 19 women have died in violent circumstances. And Gardaí attended, on average, 154 domestic abuse incidents every day since her death. Tonight is not a debate, it's a conversation. Because we need to talk about men. Of course, not all men perpetrate violence against women. But too many women live in fear because of their gender. We will hear the voices of survivors of abuse and those who have lost a loved one. We have people who work with both survivors and perpetrators of abuse who will give us some insight into the minds of the men who hurt and harass women. Some of you may find some of tonight's conversation upsetting. If you are affected, there is support. You'll find those details at rte.ie forward slash helplines. I'm going to bring in Pauline now, Pauline Tully. People will know you, of course, the Sinn Féin TD. But maybe not everyone is aware that you are we're very lucky to have you here tonight and that you're, you're very lucky to be alive. Yeah, um, I was uh, attacked by my former husband on Christmas Eve in, in 2014 uh, in my own home. We'd already been separated, uh, legally separated for 10 months. Um, but he came to my home on Christmas Eve unexpectedly. He was, I was expecting him a number of hours later to take the, the children out for the day. Um, but he came and he turned up and uh, came into the house and uh, attacked me. Um, I was stabbed 13 times. I was um, hit, I was kicked, um, and it was an attack that went on for a couple of hours. It wasn't a frenzied attack, it was a very kind of, you know, I don't know what you call it, a, a controlled attack almost. Um, and like well, something that Jason just said, um, the words he said to me, if I can't have you, nobody else can. So even though he was in a different relationship himself at that stage, he suspected I might have been in a, a new relationship and he couldn't handle this. Um, there was, it, it just seemed that he felt if I was in a relationship with someone, especially someone who knew him, we must have been talking about him, we were laughing about him. You know, it, it, it was all sorts of things going through his head and he just couldn't handle the fact that I might move on to somebody else. Did you think you would survive that that night? Oh no, I didn't. This was, he came to the house around 11 o'clock in the day um, and I got out about half past two. Um, my two children were, our two children actually, were upstairs, aged four and seven at the time. And they witnessed his initial attack on me when he came in the door. Um, he actually called them down to say goodbye to me. He wouldn't let them near me or hug me. I was covered in blood. I'd been stabbed several times at this stage. Um, and they were upstairs. Um, when it went quiet, they thought I was dead. And when they heard me screaming, they knew I was alive, so it was a small comfort to them that I was screaming, even though I, I would scream, even though I knew nobody could hear me where I was. I, I still screamed anyway, you know. Can I ask you, and you, you know, you're able to tell the story uh, almost matter of factly at this stage. I know you've told this story many times in, 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 in this time. How do you recover from that kind of trauma, how, and, and how do you bring your children on from that kind of trauma? Um, yeah, well, it's just. I suppose when you initially separated, um, I mean, the relationship had been good at times and poor at other times. There was never physical violence. And I suppose I thought domestic violence is physical violence and you know, the, the threat of violence, the verbal abuse, I didn't kind of see as you know, domestic violence, um, which I think we need to realise it is. Um, but I mean, there were many times when we were separated for a time and then I give him another chance and so forth. I suppose after we eventually separated, when he, he physically assaulted me and I got a barring order against him, I went through a period of being very angry, angry with myself for not having seen what this relationship was like, what he was like, but also grieving for a relationship that didn't turn out the way I had hoped it would. Um, so I suppose in those months I would have saw counselling, got counselling. That, that was before the, the attack on Christmas Eve. Um, so after that, I mean, I just, I suppose I have a very good family, I had very good colleagues I was teaching at the time who supported me and I just thought to myself, I have two children that I have to look after, I have to look out for. And I suppose I was always conscious of the time, at the time as well that if I allow this relationship to continue in the way that it was continuing, I was going to impact on them and they might grow up thinking that this was normal behaviour and that was something I was very conscious of 
Um, so, I, you know, I just had to get out of that relationship in the end. Do you think, and this is something we hear, that women in your situation, women who have, uh, you know, been involved in, in violent relationships that have gone on for some time, that there is a lot of victim blaming that scenario? Like, why did you pick that man? Why did you stay in that relationship mm -hmm. for that yeah. length of time? Yeah, and uh, look, I see a lot of women in my constituency um, who come to me to talk about their own relationships and I think they just want to talk to someone who they feel will understand what they've gone through and um, it, it's very common there's a common theme across all the relationships but sort of behaviours and things that are said but a, a lot of people don't understand why women don't leave the relationship but it's very very complicated it's very difficult sometimes the perpetrator has groomed all around him to, to think that nobody's going to believe those women. Um, I've had women tell me their own families didn't believe them because their partner had groomed That's their families so too. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, it, it, and sometimes they've nowhere to go. Um, but I think we have to change the conversation to why do men do this, not why women don't leave. Why don't do leave. women yeah. are women in that situation? Yeah. Okay, and we'll come back to the nowhere to go uh, mm. later in the programme, uh, Pauline. But I want to bring you in now, Alexandra Ryan. You're founder and CEO of Goss.ie. Um, and you were the face of the government's No Excuses campaign, which was this campaign to combat the sharing of intimate images online. Can you explain to us how you got involved in that about your own experience? Yeah, about seven years ago now, um, I had a partner at the time who filmed us having sex, which I didn't know about, so I was completely without my consent. And after that happened, it was actually a woman um, got the video and blackmailed me for years over it. It was years and years of torture, but I think what it really opened my eyes to was just how severe the gender imbalance is. And all of the stories today so far, it all comes down to the same thing. Like when it happened to me, not one person asked, was I okay? Everyone presumed straight away that somehow this was my fault. You know, slut shamed, she was well up for it. Like, why would you feel sorry for her? And it wasn't until I wrote my story in 2020 when Coco's Law came through that people actually realised what had happened to me. Like the automatic belief straight away is to blame the woman. No one ever blamed him or asked why this video was made or anything like that. And it just shocked me because I started to really realise how big an issue it is. And to me, it all comes down to the same seed, which is misogyny, which leads to abuse, harassment, murder, rape. It all comes from the same thing. So something so small as like being wolf whistled on the street or you know, a girl calling another girl a slut, that is literally what begins the journey for other men and other women to think it's okay to degrade women. And it just climbs and climbs and climbs. So to me, you know, listening to other people's stories, I'm like, God, my trauma is tiny, but it's part of the same tree that grows into the most horrific end, which is the murder. So I, I'm just trying with all the work that I do to get people to understand that it's actually the small things we need to be really concerned about from a very, very young age, because those thoughts and those processes, even women against women, it perpetuates other men to think, yeah, she is less than, women are less than. And I really think people need to understand that it starts that small because it's hard for a lot of people to understand what everyone here has been through because they haven't. So sometimes it's best to bring it down to the actual little things. I think things. that most people have experienced those small things. And you, you were very strong on the fact that you think men in particular, and women as well, but that we should call each other out, that men should call Absolutely. their friends out for, yeah. for banter and, and, and you know, what they might share on their phones. Yeah, one of the big things about the No Excuses campaign, I had to say to even male friends of mine, they'd be like, oh, I got a video sent to me, but don't worry, I never sent it on. And I was like, what did you do when you got the video? Oh, nothing, like I didn't send it on. And they thought they were the heroes. And I was like, you should stop and ask that person, why did you send that? Like, we all have to look out for each other. We have to stop each other. And I think men honestly find it a really uncomfortable conversation to be like, hey, where did you get that video? Or why did you call that girl a slag? Or why did you hit her? You know, these are the conversations that I don't think happen and it needs to happen. It's fathers to sons, it's brothers, it's cousins, it's friends. And that's what I hoped with the campaign that was going to maybe start those conversations because like you were saying to Sarah, sometimes we direct this all at women, but we're the women that are suffering, we're the victims. We actually need men to listen to the conversation. Let's talk about the impact that this violence um, has. It's much wider than those directly affected because it undermines our sense of security and particularly in the wake of Ashley Murphy's murder, makes some women feel that nowhere is safe. I want to bring in Grania Walsh now. Where is Grania? Grania. Uh, Gran, you're a boxer from Tullamore. Yep. I know you're living just a few minutes from where Ashling was murdered. And I know that this had a big impact on you personally and on your friends. What changed for, for all of you that day? 
Well, obviously, Ashling's death had a huge impact on people all around the world, not just in Ireland, but coming from Tullamore and being so close to the canal line. And it was a it was a running route that I have done many a time. And um, since then, I haven't done once. So it just shows that like Ashing took every precaution necessary that day and still it wasn't it was enough for her to save her life but it's just it really is terrifying and it's shocking that women actually have to think of all these things that oftentimes men don't ever have to consider when they leave the house and in for, in like in terms of exercise exercise is something that we should be able to enjoy not fear that we could be murdered and yeah you might think it's one in a million but that's, it's too often, like you said at the start, about how many people have been affected and how often it's happened since Ashling's death. It's something that I'm really glad is, is being talked about more. And I'm not sure what the answer is, but it's definitely something that needs to be spoken about more. Yeah, and I know I think a lot of women feel particularly vulnerable when they're in their exercise gear. They're, you know, you're likely to attract more comments, more, more looks. You set up a self-defence class for people after that happened. Yeah, it wasn't necessarily self-defense. I just used my profile. Like I'm a boxer, obviously, and the fact that it's a, a contact sport, people kind of seen it more as a self-defense defense thing. But for me, it was more about getting women together in groups. We actually raised money for Offaly Domestic Violence, and it was basically just about getting encouraging women to be together and exercise in groups because obviously Ashing was alone that day, and. If, if someone is watching, they'll target the people who are on their own. So my thought process behind it was to buddy up and get a couple of friends together. Like I said about exercise being enjoyable and it should be shared with people. So rather than doing it on your own, I got a good few people into the park and, and we had a great day that day. And you know, you're a boxer, so people might say you can look after yourself. You must feel kind of physically fairly secure in how you can ha handle yourself. But obviously it's not enough for you. Yeah, I, I think like people have said that to me and only recently like people are saying, oh, you would have been OK if that happened to you. I don't I don't agree with that statement at all. I think like if someone even if you have headphones in and someone tips you wanting to ask you a question, you get startled by it. So I think if you're walking along minding your own business and there's someone watching you and wants to attack you and has a knife, you don't have any chance whether you're world champion or whether you're just someone walking down the canal line like Ashing was. So I don't agree with the fact that people think because you're a boxer and because you're strong that you'll be able to defend yourself. It's just about getting people together.